Greetings to those of the Settle Systems. My name is Sven Bielin. I'm a professor at Penn State of Engineering Design, Electrical Engineering, and Aerospace Engineering. Today, what I'm going to be doing is reviewing the spaceships from Starfield and comparing their parts and specifications to those of real-life spacecraft, both current and perhaps what we might speculate for the future. So let the countdown begin. I do see when I look at the engines now that they look very much like the engine bells that we would typically see on a rocket engine, either a monopropellant or a bipropellant type of rocket engine. You see essentially cooling channels. You see the bell shape that's so common. You know, there's no air input like would be on a jet engine where you need an air flow through the engine. What you see is essentially that these must be fueled by some sort of liquid propellant. And that's what we would suspect is held in the fuel tanks. So when we look at the fuel tanks, these I think are fairly realistic. They need to typically contain pressurized fuel of some kind. So you'll see rounded edges if they're longer. If you zoom in, you'll see what almost looks like a carbon fiber wrap on them. And that wrap is there to provide the strength such that you can have an extremely pressurized fuel in these fuel tanks. On rockets, however, these fuel tanks are always internal to the structure and never external to the structure. Where we find external fuel tanks are typically on sort of external pods on like a fighter jet or something like that. But on spacecraft, they are always internal if they're within an atmosphere. My first impression with the docking port is this is arguably, I would say, probably the most realistic thing on the spacecraft. It really follows what I've seen on essentially the space station, uh, the Dragon docking. There's a number of different elements that you need to be able to do with a docking station. First off, you need to be able to account for the fact that there may be some misalignment as things are coming together. They're not, maybe not necessarily straight in together. They may be coming at an angle. So you need to be able to take that misalignment. You could also have misalignment in, you know, basically all three, roll, pitch, and yaw of the situation. Once there's contact, it needs to be able to make the connection. And so those like little flappy things that you see around there, that's to be able to essentially pull in the thing that it's being docking with. What I see is a lot of shock absorbers around the edges. And again, you're having two fairly large spacecraft coming together, they're heavy, right? They need to be able to, even coming together very, very slowly, there's gonna be a lot of um, extra force that happens and that's gotta be able to be picked up by those shock absorbers. So these I would say are very realistic. They're round, uh, round is the best thing if you're trying to make a seal. And so these look, to me, like what I would see on, you know, the space station and other spacecraft that go ahead and visit the space station. As I look at the docking port, I also look at the material that's around that. There's this white material. It's called low temperature reusable surface insulation, LRSI. They're white in color. They're where you expect less temperature, essentially. And then on top that are not tiles, they're flexible insulation blankets, advanced flexible reusable ins insulation, and that's low denserous fibrous silica batting material that had a quilt-like appearance. If you look at pictures of the space shuttle on the top, the white part, this looks very, very similar to that. So I think there's some really great photorealization here that's going on with respect to that surface. To the cockpit, you know, this again looks to be fairly realistic. There's maybe a little less glass than would be, say, in the SpaceX Dragon, which is almost exclusively glass, meaning no switches, dials, knobs, doodads, etc. Everything's on a screen. If you look at Starliner as opposed to Dragon, Starliner has more switches uh, and less glass. But there's been an evolution. If you go from the Apollo era, that was almost exclusively switches, dials, knobs, to the space shuttle, you had sort of a good mixture between glass cockpit and switches. And then finally to SpaceX, you're getting to almost exclusively glass cockpit. Also, I would expect to see, just like with advanced fighter jets and things like that, is the heads up display elements that are in there. Those are very useful because you don't have to go down and look at the displays. You can just be looking straight out and get the important information needed as you're navigating. So as I look at the seats behind in the cockpit, right, they have no direct visual line to essentially see out. These seem to me a lot like, say, the navigators that used to exist on old 747s that you would have to have that. They typically didn't have the line of sight that the pilots did. They were there sort of navigating. Perhaps that's kind of the role 
that these positions in the cockpit are playing. They could also be parts of the cockpit where you're looking, if, if you're a weapons engineer or something like that, those are typically always further back than the pilots. I could see a role where that would make sense. When you've got a spacecraft, you've got to make it as light as possible because any of that extra weight is have, going to have to be carried by your engines. That requires more fuel. And so landing gear need to be very strong. They need to keep the entire weight of the spacecraft. You've got to be able to deal with the fact that as it's landing, it'll probably come in a bit hard. And so there's got to be shock absorbers. I see the shock absorbers in there, which is what I would expect. But to make the system a bit more lightweight, what we call light weighting techniques in engineering, is it looks like they've essentially removed material where it was not needed for the load paths. And so that's a very prominent technique for light weighting is that you just keep the material where you need them for strength. What's interesting to me is it looks like that light weighting was done through a machining process, whereas nowadays we actually do that light weighting very much through additive manufacturing. So essentially, we've got design software that looks at the load lines, puts the material there. We put it into a 3D printer. That 3D printer makes that stuff, puts the material, the metal down exactly where it's needed. And it, it all almost has kind of a little bit like a, an alien look to it. That is what I would sort of expect for something 300 years into the future, that they would really have taken advantage of essentially additive manufacturing techniques and been able to lightweight on the spacecraft. Yeah, as we look at the Rambler, seems to be a bit sleeker, sort of more rounded surfaces that are on it. You know, this thing to me looks more like, like an Airbus than it does a rocket, a little bit more rounding. It still doesn't make it, in, in my view, something that could launch off the earth through the atmosphere. It's something that could certainly, you know, fly around in the atmosphere, but would be a challenge. And then also just the way it's oriented, it takes off, you know, straight up horizontal as opposed to flying in a vertical direction. The fuel tanks, interestingly enough, look to be what I would say less advanced than that on the frontier. They're not carbon fiber wrapped. They look to be just a sort of straight metal. That could be because they don't need to have the pressure. Maybe there's a slightly different fuel in them. They're also larger, it looks like, than was on the frontier. They look like like they have been light weighted by removing material from the outside. These large engines in the back, right, they're engine bells. They look again like they've got some cooling paths in them, which is, is very important. They look to be fairly fixed without much capability for articulating. So typically most of the engine bells that you'll see, whether it was on the space shuttle or on the Falcon, they'll have the ability to articulate by a few degrees at least. And that's necessary to sort of match the thrust or maybe to change the thrust if you're trying to steer or turn a little bit. I could be wrong, but it doesn't look like there's very much ability for those to articulate. It looks like there's engines on the bottom, and those look like they do have a little bit of ability to perhaps articulate. They've got essentially some pistons on the outside that perhaps allow them to articulate around. And so perhaps the engines on the back are meant just for pure thrust, essentially, when it's already positioned, whereas the ones on the bottom essentially are there to articulate if needed for landing and and launching and things like that. So this cockpit, you know, as opposed to the other cockpit where you have pilot and co-pilot sitting next to each other, here you have a single pilot up front with support on either side, which is an interesting, I guess, way to do that. One of the challenges is the reason why you put the pilot and co-pilot next to each other is if one of them is injured, sick, something happens, etc., the co-pilot can take over immediately. So in a situation like this, where you don't have them side by side, that might be a little bit more difficult. Also, what I find interesting here is that, you know, the pilot seat is pretty rugged, you know, can deal with a lot of impact. Two seats to either side seem to be much less so, more of sort of the Starship Enterprise captain seat or first officer seat. So it'd be interesting to know whether those are intended to be uh, occupied during takeoff and landing or whether they're just to be occupied sort of when navigating around where you don't have launch loads. When I look at the underside of this spacecraft, I see a lot of sharp corners. So the top tends to be fairly aerodynamic, but this cargo door would make it very difficult for this to land in an atmosphere because there's places where essentially you're going to get a buildup of heat and this can be kind of um, destroyed. I also would not install any lights on the bottom because that's going to be very difficult to deal with the heat and, and tolerance of the heat. Even though it makes a lot of sense, you've got less light coming in down there. You want to be able to load things. I would not have lights on the outside of the spacecraft on the underside at all.
So when I look at the Galileo, it's kind of an interesting shape for a ship, maybe something almost like a catamaran or a trimaran. We've got these two elements on the outside and you've got the center part with the cockpit. Interestingly enough, it looks like the load path between the outriggers and, and the center go through the fuel tanks. You would not want to put the loads like that through a, through a fuel tank. The, the fuel tanks are much larger than on the other ships, which probably reflects the fact that this is a larger ship. It probably also has larger cargo holdings, so it's going to need more fuel to take off land, etc. So those are going to be much larger than on the previous ships. Towards the back, you've got essentially some exposed longerons. Longerons are very common, used in spacecraft essentially to uh, lightweight a spacecraft, provide the support lines, the load lines, without an excessive amount of material. They look to be relatively properly placed with the load-bearing lines. I, I might have done something slightly different, but they are there to, to provide that load-bearing capability without providing too much weight on the spacecraft. Certainly, I would not put an oblong engine and then have a divider in the middle of that. Maybe the thought is that one side fires versus the other. I don't know what you're getting as opposed to having, say, two separate engines or three separate smaller engines in this case, other than maybe, you know, it looks cool, but I don't think these are particularly efficient when it comes to being able to provide thrust. Yeah, so I'd just like to make a, a general comment as I'm looking at these engines. These spacecraft are what we would call single stage to orbit spacecraft. You're going to keep the entire spacecraft together as you go from the ground into orbit into space. And the Aerospike engine is a very interesting engine because it's designed to be used through all stages of flight. If you took the engine bell and you cut it in half and then you put those bells on either side like this, the engine uses the air outside as the outside of the bell as opposed to seeing the, the rocket plume coming straight down like you typically see on Earth. Earth, you'll see it actually spreading out pretty wide. And that's actually what the Aerospike engine really takes advantage of. And so it's able to work through the different regions, high atmospheric pressure, lower atmosphere, in space, etc. I, I find it a, a little interesting that, you know, these concepts for single stage to, to orbit engines um, are not used as part of these spacecraft, given the fact that they have to fly through a lot of different regimes. When I look at the cockpit on the Galileo, it's a much, much larger cockpit. What I do find kind of interesting, which sort of belies the fact that it's a cargo, is sort of the floor in the middle. It's what you'd see if you go into like a, a C-17 and you look at what that cargo ship is like. So I think there's some elements that are very similar to that, uh, which kind of help us to understand that this is a, a cargo ship of some kind. One thing I just want to say, I mean, you know, nothing that I've said is trying to take away from the fun of playing the game. I think you always go into these with a bit of suspension of disbelief. So it's just really meant to amplify some things that, that certainly are what we do today or what we what I would see in the near future, but certainly not to be take away from any of the fun of, of playing the game. So Thank you.